symptoms during the COVID outbreak. Um, really interesting lesson this time round. Uh, we're going to have a look at web app attack hacks, absolute ponage. Um, it's going to take you through a little bit of a journey. We've got some Nmap stuff to have a look at first, um, understanding the network, the switches, the flags. Um, so we're going to play around with Nmap um, in, at the start of this. Um, this would be considered um, the enumeration stage of, of, of an ethical hack. Um, this is really going to be focusing on a web application. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll scan our targets, uh, we'll find what information is on that targets and how we can use that information to further enumerate our target. With that, excuse me, with that information that we find, um, we will be able to um, have an area where we can upload files. And then what we'll do is we'll create some uh, shell codes and uh, a payload. We'll upload that to our target victim, and then hopefully we will be able to catch the um, catch that file uh, and replay it back with a shell. And we should own that system. Absolute ponage. So, without further ado, let's get on with it. So, who am I? Um, your teacher, uh, Tom Sinclair, ex-military for ten years. Uh, I focus very much on the web application uh, of the offensive security side. So you tend to get infrastructure testers and web application testers. I started within infrastructure, um, but I had a found love of, of web apps. I just thought yeah, there was a lot more that you could, they were very more dynamic and, and, and more interesting for me, especially with them, um, you know, AWS and, and Google Cloud, you know, really big players in the teams there. Lots of businesses are signing up to cloud and using their infrastructure on the cloud. So kind of the future for me, in my personal opinion, uh, I've been an offensive security consultant now for about five years um, and a massive red team enthusiast. So going all the way through to um, trying to take on the blue teams to get past their defenses, their uh, intrusion detection systems, firewalls, prevention systems, uh, anti-malware and antiviruses, um, and to gain um, some form of objective or data uh, to, uh, usually, uh, or of course, domain credentials. Um, and then what we try to do is, is at the end of that exercise as, as a red team is we come together with a blue team and we say, OK, how did you catch us? You know, um, were we making too much noise on the network, which we'll have a look at um, shortly with Nmap um, and how much traffic it actually generates and how much noise it actually generates on the network and how we can limit our footprint um, to stay as stealthy as possible in order to, to gain attacks. Um, so effectively, the blue team learns off the red team and the red team learns off the blue team. Uh, those exercises are conducted in kind of like a purple team exercise um, and only enhances our capability. Um, before we start today's session properly, um, I would just like to home in on the, the, the Computer Misuse Act. Um, the skills that you'll be taught in this lesson um, can be used for quite damaging and devastating effects. Um, so I'd like to just make it clear, you know, not spend too much time on it, but make it clear that we're only going to use these methods on a system that we own, maybe our own internal networks, or of course, virtual environments such as virtual machines um, or cloud-based um, like Docker style uh, machines and stuff like that. But the point is here is please only use these attacks um, should you have uh, the right to do so, because it can land you into quite a bit of trouble. Um, people say, oh, it won't be me, I won't get caught. Uh, but nonetheless, I've worked with um, you know so many people that, that that have had that kind of attitude, and it has had massive effect to them, not just their careers but their personal lives as well. So please be responsible with this kind of technology that you're using and the techniques that you'll be sh uh, be sharing with you today. Um, just make sure that everything is in in a secure environment in terms of you own it um, and you have permission to do so. That's the key word there. Please don't go scanning your neighbours or you know, targets that you don't know what they are because it's just it's just wrong, guys. So boring stuff out of the way, shall we get on with it? So the agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about Nmap. Um, for me personally, Nmap is the go-to tool that, that, that every penetration tester will use. Um, there are other tools out there that you could use to say to, to, to achieve the same goal. You could write your own script in Python or Perl, Ruby, whatever, um, if you're a, obviously a scripter. Um, I'm not a massive fan on coding. It's just not my area of love. So um, I kind of stick to to what I know. Um, there's tools out there like Mass Scan, Unicorn Scan, and loads on GitHub as well. But what we tend to do is we we start with the gold standard Nmap tool, uh, which we'll talk about um, next. And we really really need to master this tool. The more 
um, education we can get around NMAP, the quieter our scans will be, the more stealthy we will become. Um, and hopefully we will not get caught by the blue team. So NMAP really helps us to do this and map out our network. It's really important that we understand the output of NMAP and what that tool is telling us, what information uh, it can find about the target, how we can use that information to further enumerate targets to gain access uh, and then gain persistence, which means that once that access has been cut or we cut connection, we can then gain back access to our targets, such as creating a username, for example. And NMAP really helps us to, to map out those services, those versions of services, uh, and what's actually sitting on that network. So fingers crossed, um, I can try and bring a bit of context around NMAP. It's probably, in my opinion, the most important tool for you guys to spend the most time on to actually understand what you're telling NMAP to do and what NMAP is actually bringing back for you. Uh, once we have enumerated our target a little bit using NMAP um, and we go and visit the target, we'll find that there's an area that we can upload uh, files to this, uh, to this web application. Uh, this uh, it's a tomcat box and um, i'll actually be using uh, a box on hack the box so I'll, I'll be i've already connected through ppm um and if you guys have any questions whatsoever that drop that in the comments and i'll teach you how to to um uh use the vpn in hack the box it's an awesome um environment to be in and it's and of course it's safe as well you you, you have privilege to do this once we've up, uh, found this file upload area, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create something called shell code, um, basically a payload uh, to upload to that, that looks like a file that that system accepts, such as, you know, you get different file extensions, such as .doc, .pow, uh, .ppt, uh, .jpeg, uh, .war, uh, and all these other different, hundreds out there. And certain applications I'm only going to accept Sorry about this, guys. Bear with. Sorry about that. Um, like I say, we haven't rehearsed this. This has been a, a very last minute COVID-19 thing. So, um, so apologies with that. Uh, but let's get back on track. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a shell code. Uh, that's going to create a reverse TCP connection back to us as the attacker. And then what we'll be able to do um, is effectively absolutely own that box. Uh, have a look at what privileges we are sort of go down through the file system, see what files they have on their systems uh, and have it basically own the box, which would be really cool. Um, this box that we are using is called Jerry of Hack the Box and it has an IP address of 10.10.10.95, which you'll see shortly. Um, after we've done, uh, there's only a couple of slides here today, guys. It's pretty much all hands on keyboard watching uh, the process on how to hack. And then effectively what we're gonna do uh, is have a look at some further resources that you guys can go away uh, so just hack the box over the wire. We'll get onto this slide uh, that, that, that you can practice on in safe environments and actually learn quite a lot. We'll have a look at what the interesting next lesson is. We really start up in the ante and bringing all the skills that you've learned this week into practice uh, for further more types of attacks. Uh, and then I'll finish off obviously with the thank yous and uh, that will be your hacking uh, web applications uh, completed for today. So moving on. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Nmap. Um, like I say, it's probably the most important tool. Um, we have two versions of, uh, and Nmap stands for Network Mapper, um, and we have two versions of this. Uh, we've got Nmap, which you can see down here, uh, bottom right, uh, it's the command line version. Uh, as, uh, as you can see, demonstrated quite coolly by Trinity in the Matrix, if you guys have ever seen that. Um, absolutely spot on. It was one of the uh, the only videos that we've seen NMAP. It is getting a little bit more popular in TV shows like Mr. Robot and things like that. Um, but nonetheless, pretty cool for, for certainly going back a few years now. Um, but what is it? How does it? But so for us as, as, as ethical hackers, penetration testers, web app hackers, infrastructure testers, whatever you want to call yourselves, uh, whatever your title may be, um, it's effectively an information gathering tool. It's, it's there for enumeration of our targets. Um, and we'll go into that uh, on the next slide a, a little bit. For those that are a little bit worried, uh, maybe you've never had hands-on sort of command line experience down here, um, and you're a little bit, you know, oh, I'm not sure if that's for me, there is a GUI version, a graphical user interface version of Nmap um, called ZenMap. Um, most ethical hackers would say, try and stay away from this. 
Um, you know, try not to look like a script kiddie. It's, you know, but to be honest with you, um, professionally, first and foremost, I would probably start with this tool because as you can see, it maps out nicely on what hosts and services you have on your network. So you can visually see, uh, cause sometimes this, we can get drawn into the information here and get a bit overwhelmed with the information that's coming back with us. So we really try to, to first and foremost, understand our tools, understand the output of what it's telling us and what we're telling that tool to do. Um, so I like ZenMap to a certain degree, first and foremost, to find the discovery of our hosts on that network. Um, but it's really good for those that are going to be going off and doing stuff like CEH, Crest, OSCP. Um, it's more the Crest than the, the Tiger schemes. Um, I, I, I recently did the, the, the Check Team Members course. Um, and you'd get asked questions like, um, out of those 20 hosts, for example, how many of those hosts are running HTTP? And you've only got a couple of seconds to look through your output to say it was this host, this host, this host, and this host. And that's what ZenMap's really, really good for doing. There is obviously the Nmap database that we'll come on to in the next few weeks, um, but ZenMap makes that really, really easy to do. So let's have a look at Nmap in a little bit more clear detail. Now there's two commands that you really need to take away from you uh, with any tool. This isn't just Nmap, uh, this is with any tool whatsoever. So what we do is we have uh, two main commands. We've got this dash dash help or dash H, whatever you prefer. I've used dash dash help in the example here. Um, and we give a tool name first. So say that we're not familiar with Nmap. We don't know how to use it. We know that it maps out networks somehow, but we're not sure what switches and how, what flags we call it to, to give Nmap, to give the output that we're actually looking for. So to that end, we, we give a tool name, in this instance, Nmap, and we say dash dash help. And then this will list out on all of these flags here, this dash IL, dash IR, uh, dash SI, dash SS, as you can see, these are what we call switches or flags. And we give, this, we give the tool uh, a switch or a flag to, del to do something specific. Now, there is another command in Kali Linux or, or Linux boxes uh, called man, and we call man, Nmap. And what that will do is bring up the manual page for Nmap. Now, I don't personally tend to use the manual pages too much, uh, but nonetheless, if you don't get what you're after in terms of a dash H or a dash dash help for a tool, then man, uh, get the manual page up uh, and it will tell you what that tool is used for, how to use it in very extensive detail. Um, even the man has a manual page. So if you don't know how to use a man page, do man man, uh, and that will show you how to use these manual pages. Um, as well. So instead of going through this list and, and, and trying to, to squint your eyes and see what information is on here, what I suggest is, is let's head over to our Kali Linux box distribution and start having a play around with Nmap and seeing what information that we can actually find. So I'm going to be, uh, for this demonstration, I'm going to be using uh, uh, Kali Linux inside VMware um, because I have a license for it. You can do this in VirtualBox, Docker, uh, think back to lesson one where I showed you how to create a, uh, a virtual box environment. Navigate yourself over to Kali Linux and try to follow along with me um, in, in this part anyway. So I'm just, uh, I've been really naughty. I've not changed the configuration. So mine's root and tor, remember, to gain into it. And I've made a couple of directories already uh, in order to, to just keep organized uh, with the CD um, uh, and, uh, sorry, the, sorry, we're having a bit of a problem here. It's typing for some reason. Let's close this down and let's start again. Technical issues, guys. So, MKDII uh, stands for make directory, and we can make a directory called Tom, and Tom is now a directory. Think of a directory as a folder in Windows that we can host things in, okay, guys? To clear that again, we can type clear. Now, I'm gonna navigate to my hack the box directory, and inside my hack the box directory, I've got a few machines that I've been playing around with. And I've just called what, uh, Jerry uh, this web app for demonstration purposes. Now, the first thing that we need to do is identify our target. And this normally comes within your scope. So in our instance, our target uh, for Jerry on Hack the Box uh, is 10, 10, 10, 95. So the first thing that I normally tend to do is just make sure it's alive. Can I talk to it? And because we're getting a reply back, it says that, yes, I can reach, uh, I can reach 10, 10, 10, 95. You can communicate with us. So now that we've established some form of connection, we can bring up Nmap and we can start scanning that target. So if we didn't know how to use it, we can use the dash H and that would bring it up. Uh, or alternatively, like I showed you before, 
uh, we can use the dash dash help, which I tend to default to, to personally. So just make this a little bit bigger. Um, and let's go through some of these flags, because like I say, my personal experience and, 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 and opinion, Nmap is the tool that we need to really know inside out. So a couple of the ones that I'll pick out just because I tend to use them quite a lot is this dash IL firstly. And what that does is, is you can create a text file with say 10, 10, 10, 95, 96, 97, 98, and so on and so forth, um, and create that as a text file. And then what you can do is say Nmap dash IL for in lists, name of your targets that, you've, that you've, 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 you've saved that as, and that will open that, that, that text file up and read through all the hosts that you've put in there and scan against that target. So that can be really useful, especially in internal penetration tests. When we've already been given our scope, all of our targets, we put them in a text file and then we say nmap-il uh, and then name of our text file in order to scan all of those hosts in that text file. It's a really useful command. Uh, another one that I want you guys to have a look at uh, is this dash N, is this ping scan. So uh, kind of what I just did a minute ago is ping our targets. It's a ping sweeper and it's really, really good for finding what targets are in the in, in internal network that can be really useful. Now the dash PN is extremely useful. Um, it basically skips host discovery. And what does that mean? Now, if we uh, get a, um, a piece of information back from Nmap that says, uh, I can see the target, but it's filtered. Um, that usually indicates and tends to say that there's some form of firewall or, or some form of technology that's not um, accepting connections um, inbound to the network, such as ping, for example. Now, as we probably know, the ping command uses ICMP packets, and it's normally, a, it tends to be quite a good idea uh, to drop ICMP echo requests at the gateway of the network, or sorry, at the perimeter of the network so they don't come into our network. There's no, usually no need for um, ICMP packets to be coming in that way. So what firewalls do is they tend to drop those packets at the, the perimeters of the network, so not actually establishing a connection. It's saying I can get there, but I can actually talk to that target and it drops those. Um, and then as a result, Nmap will turn around to you and say that target is filtered. Now, if we use the dash capital P and small n, um, it doesn't use that anymore. It doesn't use ICMP, so it means it can get past the firewalls uh, and start finding your host for you as well. Uh, the dash PE, PP, and PM uh, kind of timestamps, network, uh, net, net mask request discovery probes can be really good for picking out a little bit more information. But once again, guys, be aware of how much information you're sending over the network. Like I referred to earlier, Nmap can be quite a noisy tool. So the more switches that we're using or flags that we're using with Nmap, uh, the more noise that we're going to create. Um, usually, if you're an authorized penetration tester um, on an internal test, doing some compliance testing or something like that, usually it's okay to be loud. We're allowed there on the network. We've been invited in and it's not too bad. Um, when you start, when you start uh, progressing through your careers and start going down the red teaming, um, or stealthier types of penetration testing, um, usually we try to be absolutely non-discoverable. So the less switches are usually a little bit better. Uh, the scan techniques, you'll need to know pretty much all of these guys. Um, it, this can be really, really good for um, knowing how much information, once again, that you're sending to a target. So down here, SS, we've got stealth scan, uh, also known as a half, uh, half connect scan. It does not go through the three-way uh, TCP handshake. Um, it used to be called a stealth scan because because um, we didn't go through the three-way handshake uh, and we didn't give that acknowledgement packet back to the host, um, it wouldn't be logged uh, in the authorization logs and things like that, for example. Um, that's not actually the case today. This, this would not be a stealth scan because we have initiated some form of communication between our, our hosts. Um, that would be logged and we would be discovered. So it's called a stealth scan, SS, uh, but it's not exactly stealth anymore. Uh, ST, once again, scan type TCP. So that one goes through the three-way handshake. It's more, I would say, reliable, um, but it is definitely noisier, guys. Um, and another one that we have is, is SU. It's really, really important. Um, Nmap by default scans only uh, the top 1,000 TCP uh, ports. Now, if you think back to your networking days, your ports and stuff like that, we have a wealth of information sitting on the UDP side as well. 
So we have to give it this SU flag to say, I am not interested in TCP connections at the moment. I'm interested in UDP, user datagram protocols um, connections. And the reason for this um, is you have protocols like SNMP, um, areas of DNS. Um, for me, SNMP is kind of uh, described as a gold mine. Um, if you can gain access to an SNMP um, area, you could potentially draw out users and other really, really important information, uh, router, um, network diagrams and stuff like that. So it's really important that, that we do our UDP scans in the background while we're going through and working through our TCP connections as well. Um, it is probably worth mentioning, um, UDP scans take a lot longer for the information to come back. Um, because they're fire and forget guys, remember. So, so be aware of that. It, it, it's known to take hours and sometimes even days to, to get results back for UDP. So do your TCP connections, start working through them. And while you're working through them, have another terminal in the background uh, that does UDP scans. Um, when I start to look at UDP protocols, I kind of default to unicorn scan uh, or mass scan uh, because I personally kind of tend to think that they're a little bit quicker in certain scenarios but guys there are so many tools out there on github or built into linux there are a thousand ways to skin a cat it's up to you on how you do this pick what works for you and stick with it uh, there is no right or wrong uh, sx is a is a christmas uh, christmas scan uh, and they call it a christmas scan because they're sending these uh, uh, thin ocean purge uh, push flags uh, across the network basically lights up the network like a christmas tree so uh, imagine I've, I've only used this like once um, imagine that you're on a network and the blue team aren't up to scratch they're not seeing you they're not seeing any they're not a, a raising the alarm that that they're being hacked so what we can do is start scanning with a Christmas ski uh, Christmas scan sorry um, and that lights the network up and that should start indicating if they're using a sock or something like that that there's something fishy is going on uh, zombie scans can be quite useful so this basically scans uh, a compromised host uh, it, or it gets a compromised compromised host to scan a target for you and then brings back the information to you as the attacker so effectively what that does um, is leaves their IP address in the logbooks instead of yours which can be quite useful sometimes um, the dash P uh, is port scanning so we can do dash P 22 for SSH for example or we can do the the entire range of dash uh, port one to six, uh, 65,535, or alternatively, if we did dash P dash, that would also do the whole 65,535 ports. One of the most important uh, flags is the SV, uh, which is the um, scan type version. It basically says, I can see a port that's open. I know there's a service running, but what version of that service is running? Now, if we, that's so important because if we know that port 22 is open and we know that port 22 is SSH secure shell, we need to know what version of secure shell is running in order to go and attack that target uh, or Google that version for known exploits or public exploits are out there already so that we don't have to start looking for zero days and things like that. Make sense, guys? Um, the other really important one is this SC. Um, Nmap has a default um, scripting engine inside. It has about built in loads of different scripts and effectively when you use the SC it will look for um, common vulnerabilities within that um, port number. So let's take port 21 FTP file transfer protocol for example. Uh, we're aware of things like anonymous login. Now if we use the SC flag um, whilst we're scanning port 21 on a target it will attempt to log in anonymously uh, for you and then bring back the results and says I've managed to log in anonymously that is an entry point for you so it's a really really useful um, uh, flag uh, the other really useful one is if you wanted to find the operating system uh, is the dash capital O um, be aware guys that if you're running at user level you'll have to elevate your privileges to root or give yourself root privileges uh, because operating system discovery uh, requires root privileges to do that, which sometimes I've seen people getting a little pickle about that. Um, what else have we got? Um, the OA flag for me is absolutely golden, and it basically um, it, it basically outputs uh, in the three major formats, and these are XML, uh, normal Nmap, and greppable output, where we can start grepping uh, information out of that. It's quite messy. 
um, from, from when you're looking at the eye. Um, and obviously, of course, the XML format means that you can pass those results that you're finding into another tool uh, to potentially exploit it. So I think that's pretty much um, the main flags. Um, know your flags, guys. I, I keep alluding to this fact, but if you know your flags inside out for, for Nmap, you become a very powerful asset. This is, tool isn't just for um, pen testers, ethical hackers. It's also for system admins to know what's on their network. Are there any old boxes, vulnerable boxes? And it can be quite a really powerful tool. Um, and then, of course, you've got some examples on how to use this tool down here. So I think enough on the actual theory behind Nmap. Um, shall we just get on with it and see if we can um, exploit this box? So the first thing that we're going to do is scan our target using Nmap. Now, our target was 10, 10, 10, 95. So we could do something like Nmap SV for find the versions and then give it an IP address. Now, I'm going to stop this halfway through. Um, if we press spacebar, it will tell you how percentage it's done and how long it's, it's kind of got left. I'm going to press control C. And the reason I'm going to press control C to cut this is I've already done a scan just to speed up the process uh, for you guys. So I'm going to invoke the cat command, which is catenate to my screen. And I'm just going to have a look at what results I found. Now, as you can see, my command that I use and your homework or cyber project for tonight is, is going to have a look at what these flags here mean. So I've used the command nmap, find me the version, uh, skip host discovery, and I want you guys to look at what these ones are here. I think we mentioned the OA here, which effectively brings me back my three major outputs here. My greffable format, my normal format, and my XML format because I use the dash OA flag. I, want, I use the word nmap because that's what I want to say each module as. And then as you can see, there's my target. So, Nmap from this um, basically found one port number open. Uh, bearing in mind that I've only scanned the top 1,000 ports because I haven't said uh, to Nmap to scan all ports, and I certainly haven't looked at UDP ports. But for me, this is really interesting. We're running a HTTP service, but not on port 80 or 443, uh, on port 8080, which is, it is common, uh, but it isn't typical. Uh, and the version, and we get that version uh, because we use the SV flag, is an Apache Tomcat JSP Engine 1.1. Now, any of those uh, guys that have sort of experience in ethical hacking will probably know there's quite a lot of vulnerabilities out there for Tomcat. Um, top this box that we're going to go, there are literally maybe seven or eight different ways to do what I'm going to do with you guys today. Um, so have a play around with it and see how many times and different ways you can exploit that box. So the first logical step would be to go and visit that IP address in a browser because it's a HTTP service. Normally what I would be doing is also uh, invoking a tool called Nikto. Uh, and Nikto is like a very low level web application scanning tool. Um, so I'm not going to do that because it will take time, but certainly have a look at how to use that tool as well. If we're seeing anything with HTTP service open, normally I give it a quick Nikto run as well and a direct, a dir bus, the directory bus to find more of the surface area of that web application. So, but the first logical step is open up um, your Firefox or whatever browser that you're using um, and go and visit this IP address um, in the browser. And hopefully we're not going to have too much uh, technical difficulties doing that. So the IP address was 10.10.10.95, but remember it was running on port 8080. So we used the colon 8080 uh, to navigate to port 8080. Now we are basically, we, we come to a default Tomcat page. Now my experience is um, you need credentials to get into this. So the most obvious place is what I would be doing on this web application is looking for search functions, um, guest books, anywhere that we can search for something or a, a guest cart or something like that, where I'd probably be thinking some form of SQL injection or cross-site scripting, uh, pretty common attacks for the OWASP top 10. Um, but nonetheless, I know for a fact that if we click this manager app, uh, we get uh, this um, login box. Now I have previously just done this as a trial run. Um, so there'll be a few things, a few issues, but hopefully we'll, 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 we'll work past them. So the things that we could try are stuff like admin admin. And that didn't gain us access at all. So what we tried to do um, is my next point would be to have a Google. To have a Google, 
um, and find out what the default credentials uh, would be for a Tomcat engine. So let's go and do that now. Tomcat default credentials. And as we can see here, we've got a list of um, uh, lots and lots of different uh, default credentials for Apache Tomcat down here. So one of the things that we could do is put all of these into a text file and potentially brute force them, um, kind of a brute force. It's more like a password uh, dictionary attack um, to potentially see if any of these combinations uh, of default credentials will gain us access to this. Um, so we could do it that way. Um, but we're looking at a misconfiguration issue here, which is very, very common. Uh, misconfiguration errors uh, are on the OWASP top 10. They're very, very common. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, we actually are presented with uh, a username of Tomcat uh, and the default credential of secret. Now, if we go over that, Tomcat and secret, uh, we can see that it was actually uh, one of our default credentials. Where is it? Here, Tomcat and secret here. So it looks like that they, that whoever uses this, um, whoever use, uh, configures this uh, web application probably hasn't configured it very well at all. So let's go in and try those credentials and see if we get lucky. It looks like my cookies are having a bit of an issue. So what we're gonna do is try and get a new browser, maybe a private window, new private window to refresh, put that IP back in and here we go. And let's try those default credentials. Tomcat, I'm just gonna make sure that that says S3, S-E-C-R-E-T, secret. And lo and behold, we, uh, we gain access to uh, the manager um, portal. So looking around here, as you can see, I have done this before. These are all the um, directories that are, that are sort of present on this, this web application. But more importantly, if we come down to the bottom here, uh, we've got some really important information that we could now write down uh, in our reports for our, for our enumeration for potentially other attack vectors. Uh, we now know it's a Windows Server. Um, 2012 R2, 6.3. Um, if I just move my face out of the way, we've also got this host name, Jerry, which we know it is from Hack the Box, and we can confirm that it is our IP address of 10.10.10.95. 10, 10, um, and as we can see, Apache Tomcat, uh, and there's the version there. But more importantly, what can we do? Well, looking around this, uh, there's not too much for looking for cross-site scripting. We could potentially try some SQL injections in here. But more importantly, we've got an area that we can upload a WAR file. Now, I wasn't too sure uh, initially what a WAR file was. So a quick Google um, said it was something to do with Java. Um, there we go. Uh, in software engineering, a WAR file web application resource or web application archive is a file used to distribute a collection of JAR files, Java server pages. So interesting stuff. So effectively, what we could try to do is make a shell code, make some form of payload uh, to make it look like a war file, but it's not. It's actually a really naughty backdoor that we're going to try and gain access to. So we're going to go back over to our command line. I'm just going to clear this off the screen, and we're going to invoke a tool called MSF Venom. Now, MSF Venom basically uh, creates shell code for you, um, and we give it a dash P. Uh, we want to create a Java file, remember, guys? Um, JSP underscore shell underscore reverse. Oh, is that that one? If you went on to, um, like, if you Googled something like um, MSF Venom cheat sheets, you'd get all of this and you could just copy and paste it. It's probably a better way to do that. Um, but nonetheless, we'll, we'll write it out by hand. L host is, uh, we need to give it an L host and the L host stands for local host, uh, which is us. So if I didn't know what my local host was, I could open up a new terminal, for example, or control shift T, make this bigger for you, if config, and because I'm on a VPN here, uh, this is my uh, local host and, uh, IP address. So let's copy that into our L host equals me. Uh, we need to give it an L port. Uh, which is what port you want to connect on. Um, I'm going to do um, one, two, three, five. Just trying to remember what one I did before. One, two, three. Yeah, we're going to go one, two. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> one, two, three, five. One, two, three, five. 
Cool. Um, we now need to uh, give it a file type, and the file type that we want it to uh, that we want MSF Venom to make it look like, uh, remember, is a WAR file. We then can give it a dash O for output, or we can simply just say append to um, Tom's back door, and I'm just going to call it one uh, dot one because I've already done this. So it's going to create uh, some shell code for us. We're going to upload that shell code to the file upload system. And then what we're gonna use is this really awesome tool uh, known as the, the sort of uh, Swiss Army knife of, of sort of Kali Linux called Netcat. Uh, it acts as server uh, and a client, which means it's a really, really powerful tool. Uh, and those for those guys that are going for your OSCP or things like that, um, no, NCAT, no NCAT outs uh, inside out. So if I LS, I've got this Tom's backdoor uh, one dot war file. For demonstration purposes, I'm just gonna move this to my desktop to make things a little bit easier for me. Uh, desktop. Oh. oh, I've messed this up. Hang on. Sorry guys. Um, basically, I didn't give it a root path. Silly me. Okay, uh, move Tom. What is going on here? Let's have a look. Hang on, hang on. Move Tom's back door to desktop. There we go. It's really not having a good day today. There we go. So CD to desktop, and we should see Tom's back door one. Beautiful. Cool. Right, so the first thing that we need to do is upload that to our system. So we go back over to Firefox, uh, browse to where it was, <laughs> eventually went over to our desktop. Um, Tom's back door, one dot war. Open it up, guys, and we can see that um, it's loaded. Oops, it is easy. Uh, yes, I wanted to open that one. Uh, and we're gonna deploy that. So as you can see, uh, it makes a new directory for us, and we've got Tom's backdoor number one. So before we click on that and activate that, the first thing that we're going to need to do is create a listener. So we're going to use Netcap, and we're going to say listen verbosely on port number uh, 1235. And that starts listening for any connections on my local host on port 1235. So with a bit of luck, hopefully when we click on this directory, when we go back over to our shell, uh, you'll see that nothing actually happens on the web browser, but when we come over to our shell, we can see that we've now got an Apache Tomcat um, that we can start listing directories and running through um, the actual application itself, uh, which can be quite quite impressive, quite powerful. So we now have a shell uh, on this 1010-1095 machine. So really easy to do. We could have brute forced the, the passcode to, to the manager app, um, we could have tried default credentials, we could try phishing campaigns, lots of different ways to get into this box, and this was only one of them. Effectively, what we did is we did enumeration and information gathering through MMAP. We found that port 8080 was open running the Apache Tomcat. We Googled for known vulnerabilities in that, didn't find much at the time. Um, and then what we did is we navigated to 101010.95 because it was a HTTP service. We found the manager uh, login, we tried the default credentials. Um, and gained us access. We created, a, there was an area of file upload for war files. We created shell code for that. That shell code then gained us access to a reverse TCP connection where we are here now. So really easy, really, really easy guys. So give that one a go. Um, let's head back over to further resources where we can practice this stuff in safe environments. Um, I just did one on Hack the Box called Jerry. Absolutely awesome. I do recommend the paid version because it gives you access to the retired machines as well uh, with walkthroughs. So it does, it, you can literally just copy the steps and learn through those steps. For those that are really, really new, um, try overthewire.org, this one here, um, and go through their war games. Uh, the first one I believe is called Bandit and it helps you understand the bash environment a little bit better. The guys down at Immersive Labs, absolutely incredible job. Um, they're, they're, I really like them because you don't have to have a virtual machine on your local host. Uh, your Kali Linux environment is all in the browser. So as long as you've got Firefox, Chrome, whatever it is that you're using for internet, you can gain access to this. Um, and even better, if you've got some form of school account or university account, 
uh, head on over because you can sign up for free using your uh, school or email uh, credentials. Whoops, Daisy. Sorry. Um, I'm a huge fan of Portswigger Web Security, uh, the makers of Burp Suite. Um, they have about 50 plus labs um, broken into further stages um, that you can practice your web application burp skill, uh, burp suite skills uh, against. And these guys are absolutely fantastic. So practice audio, OWASP top 10, things like iDoor, um, cross site scripting, SQL injection, absolutely awesome platform for you guys to have a look at. And then I'm a huge fan of um, Attack and Defense Labs by Pentest Academy, one of the best training uh, out there. They are a little bit on the pricey side, I believe. Um, but nonetheless, they are absolutely amazing content over there. Uh, and I do enjoy their, their, their labs as well. So have a look at those guys. Awesome news. The next lesson for you guys is going to be SQL injection. Um, probably the oldest hack in the book, but certainly one of the most uh, painful and devastating um, hacks in the book, uh, should you get it right. Um, and we'll have a look at that next lesson, um, SQL injection uh, of our targets. Your cyber project for tonight is to research SQL injection and research NMAP flags uh, and then come back on next lesson with a wealth of knowledge ready to go into SQL injection, dropping databases, deleting databases and finding clear text passwords for databases and carts into web applications. Guys, you guys have been awesome. Thank you very much. Happy hacking and remember your ethics, guys. Cheers. Bye.